This is going to be our last discussion about the classical era. We've taken a look at the classical history. We've taken a look at um, the philosophy, Plato, Aristotle. That was our last session. And today we're going to be talking about Greek drama. Now, it seems odd that we're going to be throwing drama in here since we think of drama as part of the arts. And I said in the beginning of the semester that I'm going to be covering mainly the historical overviews, philosophical overviews, and religious overviews for you guys. But the reason drama is actually going to come into the picture is because, kind of like Greek athletics, Greek drama also had a religious aspect to it. All right, so this is going to be an evolution out of a particular worship, specifically the worship of the god Dionysus. So as, the, as we go through this lecture, we're going to look at what drama was, the different types of drama. We're going to look a little bit at the mythology of Dionysus. We've hinted at that in the past because we've actually studied the Bacchic cult and the mystery religion surrounding uh, Dionysus. At least that's one of the um, religious systems associated with Dionysus. But we're also going to now turn to how theater kind of emerges out of that entire world. Okay, And we're going to focus in on some of the uh, great writers of the 5th century, particularly Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. So let's take a look at Greek drama and the festival known as the City Dionysia, which may be something that I've mentioned in the past. Uh, pretty, pretty much, I think, when we did the overview for religion. I think I just introduced it, but I didn't really tell you very much about it. So today we're going to look at it in a little bit more depth. We're going to start with an overview of the origins of drama, which are shady at best. We don't really know a lot about how drama developed um, back in the archaic period. So we're going to actually have to go back in time slightly before the classical era. era. And um, we're going to look at some of the theories as to how drama arose out of most likely earlier choral poetry. Okay, so... What you see on the screen on the, the right-hand side is uh, a red figure vase painting showing the god Dionysus along with some of the satyrs that are associated with him. I don't know if you guys are familiar with mythological creatures like satyrs, but they're these half-man, half-goat type beings that are primarily companions and followers of the god. Um, so far, I think the only thing we've really talked about with the god is his chthonic connection, meaning his, uh, his, his role as a god of the earth and fertility, particularly with respect to the vine and wine. Okay, but I'm going to give you a little bit more to him in a little while. But one of the big theories as to where all this kind of stuff developed in the arts was um, by going back to a figure, uh, kind of a legendary figure for the most part, by the name of Arion of Methemnia, um, also referred to as Arion of Corinth, who around 625 began to compose what are called dithyrambic choruses. Now, a dithyram is a particular song that would be sung by a chorus, and a chorus would be a group of men. Uh, the, the, the size varies over time. It could be upward of 50 uh, people. It could be as small as a group of maybe 12. Um, and again, probably would depend on whether you're talking about the chorus as it was used in the theater um, drama, uh, you know, tragedy, or versus the chorus that would be participating in a dithyrambic song. And these would be hymns that would be sung to Dionysus and would usually recount stories from the life of Dionysus. And they were generally associated with kind of the ecstatic worship, um, kind of um, wild nature of the god himself. Now, according to Aristotle, the dithyram was kind of a proto-tragedy. Okay, meaning that it was precursor to tragedy as it developed. And the evidence that we have for this might be found in places like the um, writings of Bacchylides, who uh, continued to write dithyrams, you know, even into the classical era when tragedy was already in, it, in full swing. You still had this older style of art, the dithyram, um, being composed. And uh, in some of his works, we find a uh, dialogue between a lead singer, right, the leader of a chorus, and the chorus itself. Now, this is going to be important because the theory as to how drama arose out of the dithyram was in the exact thing, the idea of the leader of a chorus beginning to dialogue with a chorus. So I'm going to hold off and elaborate on that in just a second. But this would be you know, kind of the first, um, what is it called, hallmark. I get that, that right on the screen. Hallmark for the origins of drama. In the late 6th century, at least the second half of the 6th century, from 546 to 527, if you guys remember, that's the reign of the tyrant Pisistratus in Athens. Now, we're going to be focusing mainly on Athens because Athens is going to be really instrumental in the development of these arts. Pisistratus, 
who was generally a fairly good ruler, as we've said in the past, um, and you know had all these building programs and cultural renovations in the city of Athens, was responsible for founding, according to tradition, the, the Greater or the City Dionysia, which is this festival where we're going to have the drama um, performed. Okay, so this would be the beginning phases of that festival, which obviously focused on the worship of Dionysia, uh, Dionysus. And the Dionysia was the second most important festival in Athens, next to the Ath- Athenaia, which was something also that Pisistratus had a hand in um, um, codifying, I guess you could say. I don't know if that's the best word for it. Around the time 536 to 533, this would be, again, still during the reign of Pisistratus, during the city of Dionysia festival, you have a guy by the name of Thespis who is credited with inventing acting. And you may have heard the term, which is derived from his name of thespian. This is a word that we use to refer to actors, right? So the idea is around this time, he takes the first place in a tragic competition at the city of Dionysia. And what makes him distinct is the idea of him really being the first actor. And that's going to have to do with, well, I'll show you in a second. I'm going to show you the evolution of tragedy very quickly. Um, again, again, this is the sketch that we have um, not a lot of hard evidence for this actually being the scenario, but it's a it's a likely scenario, right? So you have the dithyrambs performed in the honor in honor of Dionysus. You have the chorus, which would possibly be made up of individuals who dressed or imitated satyrs. Okay, remember the satyr is a kind of a follower of Dionysus, and as the chorus sings the hymn to Dionysus, they're going to tell a story. Okay, and that story would primarily be drawn from the life of Dionysus, from the various myths associated with the god. Now, at some point, the idea is the leader separates, separates himself off from the greater chorus in a way such as to impersonate a character in the story. Okay, maybe Dionysus himself or maybe some other figure. Um, you can imagine this might be something like a pantomime. Maybe he's acting out what they're singing about. Then, when we get to the time of Thespis, apparently we've got a dialogue created. So this this choral leader who is now impersonating a character in the story will start to speak as a character. Right? He'll be given lines of dialogue to interact with the chorus. And this back and forth is where acting is probably born. Okay? So if that's what Thespis developed, if that's his, his big contribu- contribution to the origin of drama, then that would definitely be a stepping stone towards full-blown uh, theater, okay? And you can see why he would be so important. And again, if he was doing this for the first time, you can imagine why he would take first prize in the competition because he's done something unique and, and new. And it's going to allow for a greater ability to communicate a story in a compelling way. And that's going to be really important for dramas. As we're going to see in the 5th century, you're going to have an evolution um, from this idea of a single actor and a chorus interacting to something a little bit more complex. So just sit back. We're going to go through kind of a chronology of uh, 5th century drama. All right, we're going to start with Aeschylus. I'm going to give you guys the birth dates for some of the, th- of the uh, great playwrights, uh, basically the tragedians and one comic playwright, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, the three great tragedians, and then Aristophanes, who is the most famous and important of the comic playwrights from 5th century Athens. So starting with Aeschylus, he was probably born around 525 BC, and he is considered the father of tragedy. Now, he's probably not the first person to produce tragedy, but he's definitely one of the greatest early tragedians whose works we have um, still extant. Extant means they're still in existence, so they haven't disappeared completely, even though most of his work has disappeared. He probably wrote somewhere upward of 90 plays during his life. We have seven that survived to today, so not very many out of that body of work. And he won first place or first prize in the city of Dionysia, because remember, religion for the Greeks was competition. Right, just like the Olympics, you have to have a winner. I don't know why. Um, well, I guess I, I do have speculations as to why this was the case, but uh, it seems strange to us today. Like I think I may have said back when we talked about Greek religion that we don't think of you know getting together for a um, a religious holiday and, and and there being some kind of victor involved. But there yeah. was. I did say that. Okay, I thought so. Um, but there wasn't this. Um, this theater, and, and I'll talk more about that later because we haven't actually gotten away from this if you think about it. But for now, let's just leave it at that. About 13 times he took first place at the City Dynasty of Festival. Around 511 BC, and these dates are approximate for the most part, 
You've got a writer by the name of Phrynichus who wins first place in the tragic competition, and he's credited with introducing female characters for the first time in a play. All right. Now, that doesn't mean he has, you have women acting on the stage because that's something you're not going to see in the ancient Greek theater. When we say female characters, we're talking about men who wear female garb and female masks because a mask was very important um, in portrayal of a character. So you have female roles, um, but they'd be played by male actors. And he also introduced the historical material. Now, like I said, the Dithyram primarily focused on mythological stories, and for the most part, Athenian or other Greek tragedy also focused on mythological themes, stories people would be very familiar with from, you know, the legends and epics and stuff from the past. But every once in a while, you're going to have somebody write something that is set in a historical period. It's the exception rather than the rule, but he does it for the first time with a, a play that focused on the capture of Miletus. Okay. Um, not long after that, tragedies start to be organized in trilogies. So when you competed at the city of Dionysia, you would not just write one play, you would write three plays. It would be performed basically back to back um, on a single day. And they don't have to be related as far as a continuation, part one, part two, part three of a story. Like when you see uh, like Lord of the Rings in three parts. It's not necessarily the same story in three parts. It could be three different stories. They may have a unifying theme or something along those lines. And every once in a while you will have a writer uh, compose something that does continue a story. So I, I just want you to know they're at least minimally grouped into three plays. Okay. Um, around the turn of the century, Pratinus of Phileas introduces the Seder play. I'll tell you a little bit more about those shortly. And then Aeschylus begins competing around 499, okay? So he'd be, you know, if the date for his birth is accurate, he'd be in his uh, late 20s by this point, okay? Now, let's move on to Sophocles' birth. Sophocles would probably be born shortly after that, around 496. He is the second of the three great tragedians, and he's produced more plays, um, than anybody else that we know of as far as I'm aware. 125 plays he wrote during his time. And we only, you know, like uh, Aeschylus, only have seven of them that remain with us, uh, meaning they were copied down and um, passed along and not forgotten or destroyed over the centuries. Now, he took first prize in the competition about 24 times, which I think is the record. Okay, so he was one of the most successful playwrights during his time as a playwright. The youngest of the three tragedians, Euripides, is born around 485. He also produces a huge body of work, 90 plays. Um, we have more of his, though, that survive. 18 plays by Euripides still remain today. But he only won the first place prize about five times. So this tells you, you know, compared to Sophocles and Aeschylus, during his lifetime, he was less popular than they were. He won first prize fewer times than either of the other two. But after his death... He seems to have been more popular than the others because more people were copying and transmitting his works down to us, uh, which is kind of interesting. And it could be, you know, some of the distinctives in his writing, um, which I'm not really going to get into, but I definitely encourage you. And I'll give you some examples of their plays, things you might be interested in reading on your own if you have the chance, because these, these are actually fairly entertaining. I don't know if you guys have ever read an ancient Greek tragedy, but uh, they're really brilliant and I'll leave it at that for now. As I get through you know, introducing some of them, I may introduce some of the plots so that you can have an idea of what's included. As a matter of fact, this is kind of coming up in a second. So um, Aeschylus apparently wins his first victory at the festival around 484. And then in 472, he wins another victory. I don't know if this was the, the very next victory, but he wins another victory with his trilogy that included the play known as The Persians. Uh, this is the only play that survived from that particular year's trilogy. And by the title, you could tell this that this is also dealing with historical information, right? So here's another example of a historical play, not a mythological play. And it basically focuses on the aftermath of the Persian defeat at the Battle of Salamis. And chances are Aeschylus himself, who wrote the play, uh, participated at the Battle of Salamis, um, 
which is, again, a great Greek victory over the Persian fleet under Xerxes. So this is kind of about the aftermath of that and basically attributes the uh, failure of the Persians due to Xerxes' hubris. And if, if you don't know what hubris is, uh, that would be the idea of a moral arrogance or pride that basically brings one down. So it focuses on ethical themes, but it also puts it in a historical context. Now, the dialogue and everything is probably obviously made up. But the cool thing is it's dealing with history and it's contemporary history. All right. So it would have been very moving for an Athenian audience who's very, you know, you know, proud of that moment, which was, you know, only eight years earlier, right, that they had this great victory. All right, next uh, on the timeline here, you've got Sophocles, uh, Sophocles defeat Aeschylus, right? So here's where Sophocles starts to make a name for himself as the premier tragedian of his day. And what he does is he introduces an idea called the protagonist. Now, if you haven't heard that idea, you've probably heard of the idea of a protagonist. In a play, that would be the main actor, the main character. The protagonist is the idea of a third actor. So at the, and during Thespis' time, the idea is he, in, he introduced the original actor, the first actor, the protagonist, into drama, actually creating drama. And then Aeschylus, his work's primarily focused on two characters, okay? A deuteragonist would be the second actor. And you can imagine what you can do with dialogue when you have two actors plus the chorus, because remember, the chorus is always going to be there. So you could have a little bit more uh, interaction when you have two actors on the stage at a time dialoguing. With the introduction of the third actor, the protagonist, now you can do a lot more with the dialogue, but they don't ever go beyond this in classical theater, right, in fifth century um, tragedy. You have three actors. doesn't mean you have three roles in a play. You have three people speaking in any one scene of a play. All right. You could have other characters, but what would happen is an actor would go off stage, change costumes or masks, come back on in the role of a different character. So there would be never more than three at a time. But this was where they considered, you know, the, the, the pinnacle of the art. And Sophocles is credited with doing that. So you could see why he would win a victory over Aeschylus, who is still working with two actors. Um, Aeschylus's complete trilogy known as the Aristia trilogy would have been performed around 458, kind of the middle of the 5th century. Uh, this is a trilogy that actually did follow a particular theme all the way through, and we have the complete trilogy preserved for us, uh, included the Agamemnon, the Libation Bearers, and the Humanities. And this is a, a series of stories that involve the figure of Agamemnon. So I know you guys, we've talked about um, the Iliad, we've talked about the characters of the Iliad, Agamemnon was the leader of the Greeks, and his story after the Trojan War ended, he comes back home where he is murdered by his wife Clytemnestra. So this basically follows the, the death of Agamemnon and the avenging of that death by his child Orestes. Um, that's basically the, the scenario in the play. So um, that would be a great example of, again, a play or a series of plays focusing, again, on mythological stories. And remember, the audience would already know these stories. It's not like they're being shown a story that they've never seen before. Um, how you tell the story is going to be what makes for a great play. Okay, I maybe elaborate on that when we get to Oedipus a little bit later. Uh, Aeschylus dies about middle of the century as well, and then the last two, Sophocles and Euripides, continue to produce their materials. So Euripides' first tragedy is premiered around 455. Uh, Aristophanes, who is the first great, uh, or the big name as far as comedy goes, is born around the middle of the century in 450. And then a few hallmarks at the end of the uh, second half of the 5th century are going to be these. Yeah, 442, Sophocles, Antigone. That is one that is in your textbook, which you guys are assigned to read. If you haven't read that, please do so. Um, it might be a little bit difficult if you're not familiar with a little bit of the backstory. So I think your textbook actually gives you some of the um, setup for that. So I'll let you guys read that. But it's going to involve the, um, the myths of the city of Thebes. This relates to the story of Oedipus, which is actually showing up. Um, I don't think it's in your textbook, and I don't know if I included it in the, um, on the course website. But... If you have never read this, the play Oedipus Rex or Oedipus Tyrannus, that would be a wonderful work to read as well. It's often considered the 
pinnacle of Greek tragedy, maybe the perfect tragedy, some people have said. Um, and that was performed in a different year, 429. I know I'm jumping ahead on the chronology, but um, a lot of times we associate the two plays because they follow a basic um, narrative, right? Antigone is the daughter of Oedipus. Now, these particular two plays were not composed as part of a trilogy. He wrote his Oedipus material uh, and performed them in different years which is kind of interesting. In between there, 431, I've got Euripides play the Medea, uh, another great masterpiece um, by Euripides, worth reading. This is, has to do with the famous character Medea, who is a witch, um, and the wife of the famous hero Jason from the story of Jason and the Golden Fleece. Uh, these are stories that I generally go over in my mythology class, so I, I have a temptation. I want to go off on a, uh, a rabbit trail and kind of uh, elaborate the narrative here a little bit, but I'm going to refrain from doing that. Okay, so those are some big, big masterpieces. The next one on the chronology here I'm giving you is a comic story known as The Clouds. I believe I mentioned it when we talked about Socrates in our last session. The Clouds is that play by Aristophanes that actually uses Socrates as a figure. And I think I brought it up in the context of Socrates' trial where he was accused of you know, corrupting the youth um, and atheism and stuff like that. So in this play, you remember Aristophanes portrays Socrates pretty much as a sophist, um, very much like a fool. And I'm sure, I mentioned also, that that play didn't do Socrates a lot of good as far as public perception. All right, And that may have actually contributed to his conviction when he was put on trial in 399, which would have been you know 20 years later. But you can imagine this play would still be... Um, maybe reenacted at various other festivals and such. Uh, his next, uh, actually the next one that I've got listed here in 411, a uh, play known as Lysistrata. This is one of his most famous plays. It involves the Peloponnesian War. Now notice, when it comes to comedy, I didn't say that most comedy deals with mythological scenarios. It doesn't. Tragedy tends to do that. Comedy tends to be more contemporary. So the clouds has Socrates as a character. It's set in Athens. Lysistrata focuses on the Peloponnesian War. When is it written? 411 it's performed, right? Right in the midst still of the Peloponnesian War, which didn't end until 404. So here's Aristophanes, uh, a great comic playwright who is really dealing with contemporary issues and critique of society and critique of politics. And in Lysistrata, it's a critique of the war. And if you haven't read that one, basically the way it works out is there are the women of Sparta and Athens who are fed up with this dragged out war. Remember, the war began back in 431, so it's been going on for like 21, or sorry, 20 years at the time that this play was produced with minor breaks in between, as we know. And the women of both city-states decide they're going to try to get the men of the two city-states to stop the war. And they decide to do this by withholding sex. Okay, that's one of the humorous elements. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's about politics. It's not about the comedy necessarily. It's about the commentary. Both Euripides and Sophocles die about the same year, we believe, 406. Um, some of their works were not yet performed, like Euripides' Bacchae was performed the following year. So he had already written the material and it was produced. And the Bacchae is going to be, I needed to include that here because this one actually involves the story of Dionysus and his visit to Thebes. I've hinted at it before and I'll probably give you a little bit more about that later on, okay? So it's relevant to this whole idea of drama, most directly because of its subject matter being tied to the god who is the origin of drama. And then the last one I have on the list here, 401 Sophocles play, Oedipus at Colonus, the third of his Oedipus plays. Again, not part of a trilogy like Antigone and Oedipus Rex beforehand. Okay, so those are the three greats. Now I want to turn to look at the types of drama. So if you weren't aware, drama is an umbrella term that includes other types of, uh, rather, basically for the Greeks, three types of plays. You've got tragedies comedies, and the satyr play. And you've probably heard of the first two, probably have not heard of the third one. Because today you can go to the theater and you can see a tragedy, you can see a comedy, and you'll never find a satyr play. As far as I know, I don't, I, don't, I don't know of any that have ever been put into film. And one of the reasons is I don't think people are writing these today, and what we do know of the ancient satyr play, we only have fragments of plays, and I think only one complete extant play, um, which I'll mention in a little while. So let's talk about the difference between them so you can have at least a general understanding. And there's differences that people have pointed out um, 
not a complete agreement as to what makes a tragedy a tragedy, but we'll look at it from an Aristotelian perspective first. So Aristotle, who wrote um, on tragedy and the different arts, uh, among his other things, right? This is a prolific writer who not only wrote about metaphysics and epistemology and political theory and um, whatnot, he also had his hand involved in analysis of poetry and art. Okay, so according to the Aristotelian tradition, drama is the type of play that involves the better than average person, meaning kind of the noble characters. And there's a transition in the plays from good fortune to bad fortune over the course of the play. Right? That's what we think of as a tragedy, kind of a, a, ending on a sad note, though it doesn't have to be a sad story necessarily. They are written in an elevated language. So this is poetry and uh, basically flowery, the language that you're not used to talking in every day. All right. The purpose, supposedly, is catharsis, and that might be a term you have heard of. Um, there are lots of people that disagree as to exactly how we're supposed to understand it or whether or not all tragedies accomplish this type of um, catharsis. But what a catharsis generally is is a purging of negative emotions and feelings. And the idea is you go into the theater and you watch a play and you watch um, kind of this emotional presentation and you are emotionally invested in it and you in a very safe way, are going through um, a change in your own self as you weep, as you feel fear, as you feel these emotions that are brought up within you through um, the theater. And this is very familiar to you today if you allow yourself, even in a good movie, to feel those things, right? You could watch a movie that's uh, sad and you can end up crying. I mean, this, this happens on occasion. If you allow yourself to go through those types of experiences, that would be kind of um, the key to a catharsis. Anyways. He also believes that you have to have a tragic flaw in your main character, which is a character defect that somehow leads the character down the wrong path into his utter destruction. Though, again, this is not going to be something we can find in every single tragedy. So while these are general characteristics, they don't always hold up. There are always exceptions to many of these rules. According to the rhetorical tradition, and if you remember rhetoric, something that was focused on by the sophist, has to do with the art of persuasion through speech, um, the rhetorical tradition believes that tragedy or defines tragedy as a fiction that is neither true nor believable. Now, I don't know how good that is as a definition of tragedy, but this is kind of uh, a way it's distinguished from comedy, which we'll see in a second. But in general, let's say that tragedies are set in the her- heroic past. Okay, And even when we talk about things like the, the Persians, which is set in historical um, time period, it's still past history, right? And it involves the heroism of the Athenians. So in a sense, it still fits this general description. But for the most part, these are older stories, right? The myths, uh, dealing with your noble characters, your princes, your kings, your heroes. And the lesson is generally going to be communicated through the failure of the main character. We're going to see what the main character does wrong, what leads them down to their destruction. And that's how you learn, for instance, how not to behave, the mistakes not to make, right? Because you can teach a lesson in a negative way or a positive way, and the tragedy is taught kind of in a negative way. But they're not necessarily sad, so don't think of the types of movies we think of today as tragedies. There's obviously a parallel between them, but they're not exactly the same thing. Now, comedy is going to be the other big one, and the Aristotelian tradition will describe comedy as a drama concerning concerning the average person, right? The, the commoner, the regular man on the street, not the kings, not the heroes of old. This would also be set in the modern day. The transition will be in the opposite direction as well. You move from bad fortune to maybe good fortune, or at least it has some kind of happier ending or humorous twist. It's written in everyday language, so it's not going to be poetic and flowery language. So that might be something you can associate with a little bit more. The rhetorical tradition says it's still fictional, but even though it's not true, it's at least believable compared to the tragedy, which was not believable. Now, in general, we'll say they're set in the present, common characters. The lessons communicated are generally through the choices made by the main characters in a positive way. We see what they do and what works out the right way. And that's, again, your lesson is how you ought to, to live, how, how you ought to act. They're not necessarily funny, but they could be biting sarcastic, and definitely when we talk about old comedy, as distinct from new comedy, which evolves later, the old comedy of 5th century, like I said, is generally politically oriented, right? Critique of society, critique of politics. So um, not unlike today's comedy. If you think about how 
Um, a lot of comedy today is geared towards political criticism. Um, we haven't really moved away from that. This is actually uh, a connection to the ancient roots of comedy. All right. The third and last of the three types of drama is the satyr play. Satyrs, remember, are these lecherous little creatures that follow the god Dionysus, half man, half goat. And the idea of being half animal, whether it's a satyr or a centaur, they tend to be associated with um, wild aspects of nature, um, sexuality, um, the ecstatic type of experience that's also associated with the god Dionysus himself. So they are the, the basic followers of the god, and they're usually characterized as drunken and lusty, uh, which is kind of summed up in this red figure vase painting because you could see in the figure himself itself the sexual aspect is very prominent, and you can see kind of balancing right there is the wine goblet. Um, so again, wine and sexuality going hand in hand as they often do. Now, as far as a drama goes, these were believed to have evolved from what's called the komos. And I didn't give you these terms, but comedy um, comes from the word komos, uh, komoidia, which is often translated as a party song. All right, so the komos would be a ritualistic procession of drunken revelry in association with the worship of Dionysus. Okay, this would be something common to the rural festivals, agricultural festivals, um, uh, dealing with the, the character or the god. All right, now, uh, the tragedy, by the way, comes from a different term, uh, tragoidia, which has to do with, uh, often translated as a goat song. Now, why that is, I may elaborate on later, but it might also have something to do with, again, the figure of the satyr. Okay, so it goes back to that early origins of both comedy and tragedy from satyrs. Anyways, these satyr plays draw their plots from, again, myth and epic, much like the tragedies do, but they're closer to comedy in that they kind of mock some of these stories or present these stories in a humorous way. And these are the most like we think of today as far as comedy because they were meant to make you laugh. They didn't have any of the dignity of a tragedy. They involved drunken adventures of these satyr characters. Um, the costumes would be, would be overtly overtly uh, sexual. Some people have actually described satyr plays as kind of ancient stage uh, pornography to a degree. I don't want to make it sound as base as maybe what you think of today as pornography. Uh, and involves slapstick humor and things like that. So um, these would be short, obviously, and they would be used as kind of distraction from the more weighty tragedies that would be presented. So I'll, I'll mention when they were performed. As far as what remains of satyr plays, we have one extant play that is by Euripides. It's called the Cyclops. So if you're familiar with the story of Odysseus, famous scene in the Odyssey is when Odysseus and his men are trapped in the cave of Polyphemus, the Cyclops, and they put out the giant's eye before they escape the next morning through the, the cave, uh, you know, tied to the bottom of the sheep. The play, the Cyclops, actually uses satyr characters as the characters trapped with the Cyclops in the cave. So it's basically a, a having fun with that particular story. And again, nothing serious or profound in a satyr play, which is probably why we don't have very many of them that survive. Um, they weren't something people continued to copy down and pass along. All right. Now, the performance. Let's take a look at how these plays were actually presented to the public. The subject matter, like I said, for tragedy, and that's what we're focusing on here, tragic performance, would have been mythology for the most part, and it was be, would be written in a poetic form. Okay. Now, the actors, like I already said, were male. They would play multiple roles, and they would play the different characters by the use of masks. Okay. So there would be masks that would represent generally character types. You could have a female mask, male mask, masks that represented older characters, younger characters, kings, peasants. Okay, so you would know kind of the role of the character in a general way by the disguise that the person would put on. And then uh, what they were made out of obviously evolves over time. Most likely in the early phases of tragedy, they had masks that were made out of some kind of material cloth or burlap or something like that, which was basically like a bag that went over the head. And you'd have the facial features sewn into the, the mask. Later on, they would have wooden masks or clay masks or something a little bit larger. And you have very exaggerated expressions. The example that you have on the screen, obviously, uh, very exaggerated because you're also looking at the stage from a distance. I'll show you an example of a theater in a little while. And if you notice, the mouth on this particular math, uh, mask is shaped a little bit like a megaphone. So it would actually have the secondary 
function of projecting the speaker's voice a little bit better because they didn't have microphones right back then. Of course, some of these theaters had amazing acoustics, but um, in general, these are open air theaters, so you can imagine that they would be difficult to hear from a distance. Okay. The costumes would also be very elaborate, um, very uh, elaborate for the purpose of being able to pick up on gestures. Um, the the gestures that the actors made would have been exaggerated, right? So you want to accentuate things like arm motion, hand motion. Um, whether they used extensions on the arms, they definitely used extensions on the feet, platform shoes to make them taller, okay? A little bit more imposing on the stage. You want stage presence for the most part. Then you also have the chorus. So you've got the actors on the stage, you've got the chorus, which would be performing in an area just off stage. I'll show you where that is in a second. It's called the orchestra. And they would be presenting the uh, song and dance portion of the play. Uh, I don't want to make it sound like a Broadway musical because it's very different, but there would be a choral, choral odes that would be performed throughout the play, and they would be done in a particular dialect associated with the Doric tribes. Okay, so remember Doric is a particular dialect of Greek. Um, and even though a lot of these plays that we're talking about are Athenian plays, and the Athenians were not Dorians, uh, they were Attic Greeks or Ionian, um, they still, the chorus had its roots in Doric art, so you continue to write those in a Doric style. There would be a dance, like I said, performed with the song, and the chorus would provide the role of narrator in many plays as well as um, a body of individuals that kind of function as a single character for the most part even though it's a group of men you know 12 to 15 that would uh, maybe represent the citizens of a town or a city and they would interact with the actors on the stage at various places and they would also describe things that were going on to keep the audience aware because when it comes to action in the ancient theater any kind of action like a suicide or murder or something along those lines would be done behind stage or off stage. So you wouldn't actually see this kind of stuff being acted out. You'd have the chorus reacting to it and describing what was going on. All right. So for instance, if somebody was being murdered, the chorus would react and describe the murder, often in ritualistic terms, almost like a sacrifice, sacrificial language. But then the body would be brought out onto the stage um, to show the audience after the act was already complete, okay? So um, very different from what we think of today. And the way it would progress from start to end, for the most part, is you would start with a prologue. You have the protagonist or the main actor on the stage first who would be talking um, in a monologue format. That's called the prologue. And then the chorus would enter next, and they would arrive in their area by way of what's called the paradox, which is the entranceway into the theater. And then once they come out, they basically remain, all right? The, uh, the, the chorus itself doesn't leave the orchestra. And they would have a number of odes or songs that they would perform that actually break up the action of the dialogue. So usually three to five choral odes separating the episodes, okay? As a matter of fact, the word episode comes from the idea that these are the things that are broken up by the odes. These are the pieces of narrative and plot um, in between the different choral performances. I already talked about violence, so um, usually when we talk about a single scene, I mean the setting of the entire play usually takes place in one particular location. You don't have scene changes the way we think of today. Um, there are exceptions to that, okay? Anyways, let's look at the theater so you can see the parts that I've already been talking about and how they would be laid out. If you have never seen a Greek theater, this is essentially what it is. Um, it's not an amphitheater. I hear people referring to something like this as an amphitheater. An amphitheater is actually uh, a theater that goes all the way around. Okay, so something like a Colosseum, the Colosseum in Rome, is an example of an amphitheater. But a theater is just a semicircle. All right, the stage down in the front. Uh, it's basically what's called the proskeneon. I'll use the Greek terms that are listed there so that you can see. The proskeneon is actually the area where the actors stand. The skene is the backdrop. So I've got both the diagram on the left and I've got kind of an artist reconstruction on the right. You can see the building right at the bottom there of the right-hand picture is the skene, which is just a word in Greek that means a tent, literally, or a building. Um, so that's where we get the word scene from. That's the backdrop for the action. Uh, the skeneum, proskeneon, which means the thing in front of the skene, is where the actors stand. And that would be raised up a little bit above the level of the orchestra, which is the round area in front. Now, the orchestra is not where 
the musicians sit. We think today you go to the theater and the you know if, if it's a play, you got the orchestra, which is the the band right that's playing the music, set way down below the stage level. Uh, in ancient Greek theater, the orchestra is just slightly lower than the proskeneion, and that's because you don't want the people down below, which happen to be the chorus, too far separated from the actors because there's interaction between them. Right? They're a character of the play themselves, and the orchestra literally means a dancing place because this is where the chorus does their choreographed dance while they sing and tell the story. All right? So that's why it's as large as it is. You need the room to move around, and it's right in the midst of the viewers. And that's the other area, the, the seating area that you could see, which would usually be built up on the hillside. The Greeks didn't build freestanding theaters. Um, if you do see freestanding theaters in archaeological uh, photographs, you're generally looking at a Roman work. The Romans develop a way to construct theaters uh, pretty sturdily built uh, through the use of their concrete and stuff like that. But the Greeks would take advantage of the natural um, terrace, you know, the um, the um, sides of a of a hill. So, for instance, the Great Theater of Dionysus in Athens is built on the south slope of the Acropolis. You got a natural place for people to sit. And early on, all they did was basically sit on the hillside when they watched the performance down below. It didn't have necessarily an elaborately built stone theater like we think of today. Okay, so. Let's take a look at that theater in particular, the Theater of Dionysus in Athens. This was, I guess this is the big theater in the ancient Greek world. It's not the best preserved theater, but it's really the most important theater because this is where some of these, actually all of these great plays would have been premiered, okay? And at its peak, this place sat like 15,000 people, which you can understand, you know, in an outdoor theater, this is possible. It's in Athens, south slope of the Acropolis, so the photo on the left, which you're looking down from above, you're slightly above the theater, so the Acropolis would be literally right behind you. Um, the stone seating that you see wasn't added until around 340 BC, so in the 5th century when, you know, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides are performing their plays, that would have been temporary seating or they'd be sitting on the hillside itself. You notice the orchestra down below as well is not circular here, and that's because this has been a Roman redesign. When you see the semicircular orchestra, you're also looking generally at a Roman era modification, right? This was a Greek theater modified by the Romans. Um, the skene is pretty much completely gone. You can see some of the uh, remains of that laid out for you. And this is the archaeological site as it appears today, and it's usually pretty empty. So if you ever get a chance to go to Athens, take a look at the um, Acropolis area. Most people go up to the Acropolis. It's usually really, really crowded on the Acropolis. But just down below is the Theater of Dionysus, and very few people actually go in there and look around, which is something I would recommend doing, especially since your ticket to the Acropolis will get you into um, the theater itself, and you have a little bit of freedom to, to actually sit in some of the seats and walk around so you can see what this might have been a little bit like at the time. All right, so that's the big theater. Now let's talk about the god. Why is theater associated with Dionysus? What's the connection? What's the god represent? Let's go back and unpack a little bit of his mythology and his characters, or his characteristics. Um, he's also known by a few names. Bacchus we've seen before. Right, we talked about the Bacchic cult, so Bacchus is uh, most common reference to Dionysus. Bromios, a um, little less well-known today, Dithyrambos, um, those would be other terms that specifically refer to him. And as far as his mythology goes, he's the son of the god Zeus and the mortal woman Semele, who is a princess from the city of Thebes. All right, so his origins are actually tied to the city of Thebes, where we have the great story of Oedipus later, right? Um, now, before I get to the birth of Dionysus via the zeus semele relationship, I'm going to go back and fill in what's called the Orphic tradition or the Orphic theology. Now, if you remember the Orphic cult, which was focused on um, the reincarnation, right? We talked about the idea of the body-soul, the transmigration of the soul, the fact that the Orphics were a permanent community that practiced asceticism and discipline so that they could eventually escape from the body. Um, very similar to the Pythagorean school. They had a particular place for Dionysus and their theology. As a matter of fact, the character of Orpheus, who the cult is named after, ultimately has um, some connections with Dionysus as well. I'm not going to go into that right now, but I will talk about the birth of Zagreus myth from the Orphic theology. So the character of Zeus, right, he's the king of the gods. P 
Persephone is his daughter in mythology by way of his sister Demeter. So you get this interesting incestuous relationship. Right? Zeus is married to Hera, but he sleeps with his sister Demeter, produces a daughter, Persephone, who then is married off to his brother Hades. Okay, you got to keep it all in the family for the Greeks. Now, in the story, Zeus actually ends up sleeping with Persephone, his own daughter, okay, and sister-in-law at the same time. It's twisted. Now, Persephone ends up conceiving the child Zagreus, who is born in the underworld. Persephone is the wife of Hades, is the queen of the underworld. So Zagreus is born there. Now, in Greek mythology, Zeus's wife Hera is usually pretty upset when he has these love affairs and usually will pr- punish people that are involved, usually the woman, especially if it's a mortal woman, or the child, um, which is generally a hero, like Heracles. You know, if you read the story of Heracles, you could see a wonderful story about Hera's vengeance on a particular, uh, particular mortal individual, Heracles. Well, in this story, she um, incites the Titans, who are the earlier generation, the preceding generation of divinities, who are actually trapped in the underworld. They're imprisoned in Tartarus. There's a story that the gods overthrew the Titans and Zeus punished them by imprisoning them in the pit of Hades. And she incites the Titans to rise up and destroy the child Zagreus where they rip the baby limb from limb and devour it, leaving only the heart behind. Kind of a gruesome um, finish for the child. But Zeus preserves the heart. Now the heart is then brought into the other story, which would be probably originally a completely different tradition, the story of Zeus and Semele, where Zeus falls in love with this mortal princess, Semele, uh, seduces her, sleeps with her, and they conceive a child that's going to be Dionysus. Now, in the mixture of these two stories, they have the idea that the heart that he preserved, the heart of Zagreus, was given to Semele, in some accounts mixed into something she drank or somehow she ate it, but she ingests the heart and when Dionysus is conceived, it's in a way a reincarnation, which would fit really well with Orphic theology, a reincarnation of this earlier child, Zagreus. Okay, so it's a reincarnation myth. Now, Semele never gives birth to the child. She's pregnant with the child Dionysus, but in the story of Semele, her sisters don't believe that she's actually um, pregnant with the child of Zeus and they doubt her whole story, so they ask her to ask Zeus to reveal himself to her in his full glory as, you know, king of the gods, which he reluctantly does, and she bursts into flames and is consumed and dies. The only thing remaining then is the fetus, Dionysus, which Zeus then takes and cuts open his thigh and places the fetus inside where it is going to grow to eventually be born as Dionysus. And that's the actual picture that you have on the left-hand side of the screen, a red figure vase painting showing the, the baby Dionysus emerging from Zeus's thigh. It's a pretty calm birth, but uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's very humorous. I love the way the Greeks um, depict some of these stories. Okay, so that's the birth of Dionysus. So he's got an interesting connection to the underworld and to the upper world. He's a chthonic god. If you remember, that has to do with fertility, but also connects to death. So he's a vegetation god. He is connected to the side of fertility that's usually associated with the liquid essence of life, whether that's blood or water or semen, um, the vine, right, the fruit of the vine, uh, grapes, and, of course, wine, which also ties into his connection with madness. If you remember, the Bacchic cult involved this idea of possession by the god, where the god, in the midst of your singing and dancing and worshiping, possesses you, right? This concept of entheos or, or, or divine possession, but he's also connected through this story to the underworld. He's a god of death. There's a dark side. We tend to think of him as kind of a jolly character, um, kind of a fun god. But the dark side emerges kind of when you don't expect it. And there's a lot of stories about Dionysus that involve some really gruesome things, um, as I'll, I'll give you a few examples in a little bit. And then, of course, he ties into the theater, and we'll see how that happens as well. So he's got a double nature, or dual nature which is not uncommon in mythology, but with Dionysus, he's kind of unique in that he's a god, but he also has a mortal side to him. This is typical of heroes in Greek mythology, where you have, like, again, Heracles, whose father is a god, Zeus, and his mother, Alcmena, is a regular mortal person. So the heroes are generally born as these demigod figures in between gods and men, immortal and mortal. Dionysus, on the other hand, is a full-fledged god from the beginning, but he's also in that middle category. So where most are heroes, he is unique in that he's a full-fledged god, but he still has a mortal mother. 
He's also intermediary between male and female, kind of a, um, I don't want to say bisexual figure, but he's definitely presented as a male figure with a lot of female qualities. He's described very often in poetry and in mythology as very effeminate, having um, descriptions of him being pale skin, long curly hair, uh, things like that. Even though sometimes he's depicted with a beard, it's not always the case, as you can see in this particular statue of him, where he's depicted very uh, much youthful. Um, and then the worshipers also, you know, are open. Men and women can participate in the Bacchic cult and the worship of Dionysus, but they would generally all wear the same clothing. Uh, they would all be kind of in this unisex uh, uniform for the most part. So it's kind of the blurring of sexual distinctions in the worship of Dionysus. And then you also have the connection between life and death, which is, again, another dualistic aspect, right? He's a god of life, but he's also a god of death, upper world, underworld, fertility and death. The followers are known as the Bacchants, right? I already talked about the satyrs. Those are the mythological followers of the god and his companions. But in real life, you have the worshipers of Dionysus would be known as the Bacchants. You actually see them in the mythology as well, also called Maenads. Now, the Maenad or the Bacchant would be the worshiper who is possessed of the god, all right? They have this ecstatic worship where the god takes over. So the word Maenad is the origin of the word today mania or maniac, right? This is being literally literally driven into another state of consciousness, okay, in the worship of the god. So that picture down there, you could see the god Dionysus carrying this thyrsus, which is his emblem, which is this um, stick with a, um, uh, a pine cone basically on the tip and these fillets wrapped around it. And he's got the um, lion skin. He's actually got a, a lion with him on the side. He's connected to the wild aspects of nature. And in front of him are two maenads, um, you know, carrying like a, basically a tambourine or aulos, which is the flute that the second one is playing. So very much this wild, again, they're naked. They've got the lion skin around them as well. And they're worshiping Dionysus and playing this exuberant music. Okay, that's part of the worship tradition. It goes right into the dithyram. All right, let's talk about the dark side of Dionysus, <clears throat> death and human sacrifice. I'll give you a few little stories that involve uh, people meeting a dramatic and devastating end, and an unfortunate end. Uh, the first one is really kind of the sad case of Icarius, who is a, a man in mythology that was taught by Dionysus how to make wine. This is the, the guy that bestows the gift of wine upon human beings. Dionysus teaches him how to make wine. He enjoys it, decides he's going to share this gift with his friends. And in the story, they've never had wine before because, like I said, it's brand new. And what happens when you drink wine? You start to get a little tipsy. You drink a little bit more. And pretty soon you find yourself drunk. And they never experienced anything like that. So after drinking this stuff, which they enjoyed in the beginning, they all of a sudden find themselves having these side effects. And they believe that Icarius has now poisoned them. He's trying to kill them. And in their drunken state, they turn on him and they rip him apart. They, they basically beat him to death and drop his body down, I believe, a well at the end of the story. So this poor guy who's trying to do his friends a favor ends up being murdered by his friends. And that kind of shows you the connection between wine, which at one point you know has these positive... Um, effects on the body, right? It, kind of elation, it changes you, makes you feel good, but at the same time, there's a fine line between the change for the better and the change for the worse, right? There, you hear about people that drink too much, and you get some people that become really fun to be around, and some other people that want to pick a fight. So there's that fine line between you know, madness and, and joy and violence and all these kinds of things. So you could see just in the idea of consuming wine, a dark side and a light side, kind of um, this duality that emerges. So this is kind of a, a sad ending for Icarus, but there are worse stories, particularly the story of Pentheus, which I've introduced in the past. This is the f setting or the focal character in the play known as the Bacchae by Euripides. And in the very first introduction lecture of the semester, I gave you an excerpt from the Bacchae, and we looked at the ending scene where his mother, Agave, comes into the stage carrying his decapitated head. So let me set up the play again uh, to tell you how this goes. This, the whole plot of the play is Dionysus coming back to his hometown of Thebes, where he, his mother, right, his, his, she's died, right? The whole story we just talked about, Semele, she was consumed by the flames of Zeus. So she's long gone. So he's coming back to his hometown, and 
the character Pentheus, who's basically the 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 guy who's in charge, is rejecting the god. He's skeptical. He does not believe that Dionysus is a god, whereas his mother, his aunts, other people, you know, the former king of Thebes, uh, goes along and begins to worship Dionysus. Uh, he's kind of a, a scary character, and Pentheus is suspicious of him, actually attempts to imprison him during the play, but eventually Dionysus breaks free. There's this earthquake, and he breaks free, and then he brings the people of the city out to worship him in the wilderness, very much the way the Bacchic uh, cult worshipped Dionysus out in the woods. And Pentheus wants to go out and follow them and see what's going on, see what his mother and his aunts are up to for the most part. And he disguises himself by dressing as a woman, and he hides from a distance and, and watches them as they drink and dance and work themselves into a frenzied state. And what happens in the midst of this, this is kind of the culminating point of the play, is they turn on him and they see what appears to them as a lion, a mountain lion. It's actually Pentheus, but when the god has possessed you, you can't see reality. They believe he's a mountain lion. They jump upon him, and his mother and his aunts basically rip him limb from limb, as you see in the artwork here. Okay, Now, he's torn apart, and Agave, his mother, actually brings his head back to town where you have the chorus react to this scene. And that's the scene that I gave you an excerpt of um, because they know it's you know the head of Pentheus, but she still has no idea. She thinks she's killed a mountain lion, and she's bragging about what they've just done. So, again, a tragic death due to a rejection of the god. Um, but this is kind of how Dionysus is. You know, he should be attractive, and you want to worship him, but at the same time, it's very dangerous um, whether you do or don't. <laughs> There's always the dark side. Um, another story is uh, involving what are called the daughters of Minyas. This is another story where the, the daughters, in a way, reject the worship of Dionysus, and he drives them mad and insane, where they draw lots to decide, you know, whose child they're going to devour, and they end up... Um, um, Lucape, I believe, is the, the sister of the, the Minyades, or the, the name of the group of girls, the daughters of Minyas is what that means. Uh, they tear apart her infant child. Uh, kind of, again, a sacrifice, human sacrifice, basically, to Dionysus, which seems to be a rare thing. So if you know about Greek religion, they did practice sacrifice, but human sacrifice was not something the Greeks generally practiced. Maybe way, way, way back they did this, but in the historical period, they did not. With the exception of Dionysus, we do know of historical human sacrifices that were offered to this god in particular. And there was a festival known as the Agriona. It was an annual festival. And part of the festival involved a priest of Dionysus who chased these women, probably representing the Minyades. And in the ritual chase, these women would try to find their way to a sacred precinct where they would be safe and the idea was if the priest caught them before they, you know, touched the safe zone, he would be able to sacrifice them to the god. He would be able to kill them. Now, Plutarch says that during his lifetime, a particular priest actually did catch the women and sacrifice them to Dionysus. So there was an actual sacrifice that Plutarch remembers. Plutarch, by the way, is the first century A.D., early second century A.D., when he's writing. So um, it seems to be, just by the way Plutarch describes it, as a rare occasion where there was actually a sacrifice. So most likely when they did this, it was more of a ritualistic acting out of the story. And the women usually would be allowed to <laughs> escape to safety. But apparently this one particular priest didn't allow them to do that. But the sacrifice was still acceptable. This is not um, some kind of crime. But again, it's interesting that it's Dionysus that received this kind of sacrifice, that dark side of him coming out again. Now, the city Dionysia didn't involve human sacrifice. It involved theater. So this is the major festival that we were talking about before, called the Greater, to distinguish it from a rural or lesser Dionysia. Now, the Greater Dionysia was every spring. This was a five-day dramatic competition, and the centerpiece of the festival was the tragic competition. There would be other competitions as well, but the tragic competition was the main thing. It was a three-day um, piece of the competition or piece of the festival which would involve three separate playwrights producing works. Now, the state ran and provided the actors for the play. They financed most of it. As a matter of fact, people would be able to go to the theater uh, at public expense, except for the fact that the nobles would also finance it. They'd be chosen, basically, to finance the chorus and that kind of stuff. So this would kind of be an involuntary, involuntary um, service to the state by an aristocratic 
family that would be chosen. And the way it would work is you'd have playwrights apply to produce some plays. And there would be three people that would be selected. No matter how many people put in applications to do this, the, uh, there would be a committee that would choose three playwrights. Each of those playwrights would then write three tragedies and a satyr play. And then on successive days of the festival, each playwright would produce or, pr or present their trilogy. So say it's Aeschylus uh, against some other guys. One day of this um, festival, all three of Aeschylus's trilogy um, plays would be presented and one of the Seder plays, or, or a Seder play, which would usually be presented at the end. It's kind of a way to release some of the tension that's built up by watching these dramatic uh, presentations of tragedy all day long. So the next day, a different playwright would produce, or present rather, I'm going to keep getting the words confused, to present his trilogy and on and on it would go until all three have been completed, and then you would have the judges declare a winner at the end. Okay, and the winner, like if it was Sophocles, Euripides, most likely they would win. You know, those some of the big names, and they would pre be presented usually with a prize that would often involve a goat. Okay, which may be again connected to the origin of tragedy in general, the idea of a goat song. Okay, so you've got this connection to the satyrs, you've got this connection to the goat prize, you've got various connections to Dionysus. So, whatever the origin of the term, um, you know, that's tragedy. Uh, there's one other thing I just thought of, and I just lost it. So I'm gonna, if, if it comes back to me, I'll fill it in a little bit later. Oh, yeah, yeah. The um, the playwrights they wouldn't just write the script. By the way, these guys very often would compose the music. Remember, this is all poetry. They would compose the music. Uh, they would uh, choreograph the dance. They may often act in the play themselves. It was a pretty big role to put together one of these plays. Okay, on a single individual. Anyways, that's the city Dionysia. That's the major festival. Now, the theater, why it's associated with Dionysus, there are various theories. I'm just going to present three of them, and this will be where we're going to finish up. First is the theory that Aristotle presents that the whole idea of acting evolved out of the dithyram, the dithyram being a hymn to Dionysus that told the mythology of Dionysus. So if that was the origin of the theater, we could see why the theater is obviously associated with the god. Okay. Because it's not always clear when you look at the play that there is anything that the play has directly to do with the god, okay? But its origins possibly do. So that's one th uh, theory as to the origin of theater. Another the uh, theory might be called the sacrifice theory. And this is attached to the idea that you have the mythology, the birth of Zagreus in particular, that story, which involves the sacrifice of the infant Zagreus, right? The tyrants, uh, sorry, the Titans tearing him apart in that story, would it be this, you know, idea of a of a sacrifice of a child. When it comes to looking at a lot of the themes in tragedy and a lot of the plots of tragedy, very often they're dealing with mythology, and a recurring theme is this idea of child sacrifice, human sacrifice. So, for instance, the um, mythology surrounding the figure of Agamemnon. We already talked about the Oresteia trilogy. The whole curse of the family of Agamemnon goes back to the story of Atreus, which was Agamemnon's father, who actually murdered his nephews, his brother's sons, and fed them to him, unbeknownst to his brother Thyestes. So you've got that child sacrifice in that story, the um, plays that deal with Heracles. Heracles is also famous for the murder of all of his own children. You might not know that if you grew up on the Disney Heracles or Hercules, as it's now known. Um, but, you know, Heracles has kind of a dark part of his story where he murders his children. The play Medea, which I gave you before, Medea murders all of her children. So over and over again in the mythology, you've got this idea of murdering of children and bloodshed. And some people have speculated that when you have stories like that presented in tragedy and on stage, it's in a way of it's a way of symbolically reenacting the death and rebirth of Zagreus from the Dionysiac um, tradition or the Orphic tradition. So that's one theory. That's not my favorite theory, but uh, it's been presented as a possibility for why theater is attached to Dionysus because it's symbolically reenacting Dionysus' sacrifice. The last one that I'm going to give you is the, the, the theory that has to do with this idea of possession and mass hysteria. I want you to think for a minute about what's going on as somebody acts on the stage, right? You take on, you put on literally a mask, whether it's for comedy or tragedy, it doesn't really matter. There's a mask that's involved. 
the actor is playing a role. They're not playing themselves on stage. This is very much what happens in the worship of Dionysus. He's a god who possesses you, right? He's a god, when you drink wine, right, your personality changes. You take on new characteristics. You take on a new persona. The word persona, by the way, comes from the mask that was worn in the theater. That comes from the Latin term. Okay, it's a face that we put on. We think of that even today when we go out and we interact with people. We very often put on a particular face to present, you know, one maybe to uh, our colleagues at work or school, um, another face maybe around our friends and family. Okay, but this is the idea. We took, take on a new role. That's what acting is. That's what happens when you drink wine. That's what happens when you worship Dionysus. But even more, besides just the actor, I think even the origin in the chorus is going to be very reminiscent of Dionysian worship because, again, the chorus, which is a group of people, they sing, they dance, they operate in unison, and they play a role where all the individual personalities are kind of subsumed into one character, right? Because the chorus acts as a role, like whether it's the citizens of a city or a narrator. They play a single role in unison together. The individual personality is absorbed into the group persona. That is exactly what goes on in Bacchic worship, in the Bacchic cult, right? It's a group that goes out into the wilderness. They drink, they dance, they sing. They eventually work themselves into a state of possession and hysteria where they are now possessed by the God, and they've taken on a completely new personality. And whatever that looked like in the theater, it was controlled, right? So the theater is a controlled version of that very same worship of the God. So you could see why the theater really does have its roots in religion and religious activity, particularly um, characteristic of the worship of Dionysus, uh, as opposed to, you know, any other particular God. You can go to places like Delphi, right, which are sanctuaries primarily to Apollo. I think I've shown you photos of Delphi, and we've definitely talked about the oracle at Delphi, the temple of Apollo is right there, but just above the temple, on the sanctuary, on the slope of Parnassus, Mount Parnassus, you have a wonderful theater preserved. And they not only had, you know, music competitions at the um, uh, Pythian Games, remember the Pythian Games are a Panhellenic festival at Delphi dedicated to Apollo, but the sanctuary of Apollo is actually shared with the god Dionysus. So for most of the year, Apollo resided there. But during the wintertime, during uh, certain times of year, it became the sanctuary of Dionysus. So you've got this duality between a god of order, Apollo, and a god of chaos and exuberance and um, ecstatic worship, Dionysus, kind of the wild and the civilized. I'm going to come back to that theme later on in the semester, especially when we get into some Roman symbology, specifically when we get to the era of Augustus. I'll kind of bring out this idea of Apollo and Dionysus. They're kind of the yin and yang of Greek mythology. But it's interesting that um, you know the theater, in a way, is controlled, but is also connected to a wild type of religious activity. So anyways, that's, that's a kind of a quick overview of Greek theater. You might not think that was that quick, but it was, and hopefully that makes sense. And from just to let you know where we're going, and then I'll open up for questions, um, but we're, that's the end of the classical period material. Next session, we're going to be actually getting into the Hellenistic period. So um, we'll be moving on to the period after Alexander the Great.